from Great Britain. Rachel is an entrepreneur and full stack developer who enjoys developing complicated distributed software. She first joined the internet in 1986, that's probably before many of you were born, uh, and has since uh, worked on uh, uh, computer aided design, networking, cryptography, digital cash, ebooks, and price comparison products. Rachel, Rachel is the founder of Lazmi, the world's best ebook price comparison website. Uh, which sends price alerts on your watch list. Originally built with Django and Python, this now includes a new front-end stack based on AngularJS and Firebase. As the founder of Intertrader in 1995, Rachel created a dot-com company aiming to create the world's first digital cash exchange. After surviving eight years of dot-com boom and bust, and after successfully selling the concept to major customers like MasterCard, Crest, and Bank of Scotland, she eventually learned uh, that being 20 years ahead of the market was not necessarily a good thing and closed the company. She then worked with Ben Laurie on the OpenPGP API open source cryptography library, moving on the BBC, where she worked on one of the world's top 10 largest CouchDB installations. Rachel is active in the technology and startup, startup companies with a particular interest in new technologies and companies. She studied engineering science at the University of Durham. She lives in Edinburgh, Scotland, and is learning to play jazz, upright bass. So, let's welcome Rachel Wilmer. Well, thank you for that introduction, and I'd like to thank the previous speaker for an excellent talk. So, Dobry Den. That's my attempt to speak Slovak. It's not very good, but Dobry Den. Okay, so I'll start by telling you what this talk is not. It's not going to be a tutorial for Django channels. Um, and what it is more is my experience of using it and what I, what I learned from, from the experience. This is who I am. You've just heard the, the, long, the long story there. Um, I'm a startup founder. Uh, eight years of intertrade have taught me that really you want to be closer to the market than where I was with that digital cash idea. Um, I'm a Google developer expert in Firebase, which is a real-time database, and now it's a mobile development platform as well, but the bit I'm interested in is the real-time database. Uh, I've been a keynote speaker at EuroPython, um, PyCon Ireland, and now Slovakia. And that photo was, in fact, me 20 years ago. Um, I didn't actually look like that then either because of make makeup and lights, but I, I just like looking at that photo once in a while. So. Anyway, so we're going to start with a little trip through history. Um, so I've been programming the internet since 1986, and a lot of things have changed over that time. So back in 87, when I, when I, was, I first got introduced to the internet, I was working for a, a research institute in Newcastle, and we happened to have a connection to the internet there through the universities. Back then, that's what you had to do. You had to really be associated with the university to get on the internet at all. And, and my first job for this, this company, uh, which was my second, second job, the right of passage to prove you were worthy of being on the internet was that you had to construct your own UCP configuration so that you could get your email. And if you couldn't do that, you didn't get any email. Um, but, so back then, what we had for, for the network um, programs, it was all command line, because we didn't have Windows or any windowing systems really then. So the, the applications we were developing on the network were email, FTP, um, file sharing, that kind of thing. So let's just skip forward 10 years. 10 years later, we've got Windows, we've got Mac operating systems, but we've got an idea that desktop apps are the way to go. Oh, go back. Sorry, I've gone too far. Go, I'm going back. Go back, go back. <laughs> oh, anyway, right, so. Uh, <laughs> Something always goes wrong in my presentations. It doesn't matter. Um, so yes, 80, 86 we had command lines. 96 we had the internet. It had become a public thing. You could go to Demon in the UK and buy a £10 a month dial-up um, system. And the, the, what we were doing then were de de developing desktop apps that would use the internet. Ten years further forward, um, and we'd be go, we were in t 2006, and then... I'm going to have to look, go back to my slides. I do apologise for this. Oh, the joys of doing live talks. Right, 97, we had desktop apps. 2007, everything was moving to websites because by now everybody had an internet connection. If you wanted one, you could just buy one. And then in 2017, which is where we are now, 
everything's mobile, it's hybrid, it's state of the art. And in 10 years' time, who knows what's going to happen? So my point that I'm trying to make here is over the course of the last 30 years, things keep changing. And the main change that I think we've moved to now is that when we're looking at doing distributed network programming, what we're really doing is talking about asynchronous programming. Back in the old days, you could get away with the old style of request-response connections, but now we need to do it asynchronously to get the scale, which is what we're looking for. So I've put this together, this little slide, which shows in that 30 years what's happened with Python, because this is a Python conference. So 30 years ago, we didn't have Python. Guido invented it about four years after I started doing this, this kind of work. Going back 10 years, 10 years forward, We've started to get Django so that people can build their own websites very quickly, and Ajax is starting to be used, which is the first use of asynchronous. Go forward another 10 years, Django REST framework has been introduced. And now, in 2017, we've got Django channels. And I'm really excited about this because it's, been a, it's going to be a big step forward for doing the kind of asynchronous programming that I want to be able to do using Django. So, old style, requ request response. Y you ask server to give you some data, it gives it you the, gives it you back. If you want to check whether the, the price has been updated or whatever, you have to do another request. New style, we can use WebSockets, which means we've got a permanent bi-directional communication set up. And why is that useful? Well, I'm going to use the flight status analogy. If you had to do it the old style way, it would mean that every time you wanted to find out whether your plane was going to be laid, you had to keep doing the same operation and waiting all the time. Whereas asynchronously, what you're doing is saying, tell me when it's changed. I've given you the instruction. You, you give me the answer when, it, when there's something to tell me. But otherwise, I'm not going to keep asking the same question. So I'm a big believer in, I'm really interested in real-time data. I've been trying to find a good solution for, to provide me with a real-time data capability for about three years now. So if you'd been listening to me doing a talk three years ago, I would have been talking about Meteor and how that was my next great hope for how I was going to solve the problem that I'm trying to solve here. And then last year and the year before, it's been Firebase, which is Google's real-time offering. The kind of thing you can use it for is for like, real-time notifications, like, as an example, the flight status up, update, um, for doing chat. I mean, a great example of that is the application we're using here to post questions. Somebody is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not doing a a, a continuous recheck, it's going to be using asynchronous programming to providing that live updates to us all. And live data updating, that's my particular interest, because this is my website for LUSME. Now, I have to tell you, it's actually offline at the moment, because I'm in the middle of it doing a big maintenance change on it all, but this is something I've been playing with as a side project for about eight or nine years, um, and in that time, everything has changed. But the basic idea is you want to book, you go to my site, you search for the current prices. As a result of you doing that search, I'm sending date requests off to the web to get updates from the, for the various vendors, and then I want to share those with you. Now, the way I've been doing that previously in the older version was to do this horrendous request response, request response, live update. So you keep asking the database for, to see if anything has changed, and that's an awful thing to do to a database. It's not good. Um, what I'm doing with this site now is to, to put Django channels in so that using the WebSocket and the permanent connection between the, the users on the site and my database, I can push data as and when it's needed. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what Django channels actually is. So on the left-hand side, we've got the Django web server and HTTP users. So everything in blue is original Django, and it's what you get when you install the current version. If you want to add in channels, at the moment, it's a standalone project. And what that gives you is the ability to have the WebSocket users. And behind the scenes, you also have the ability to put in a, a Redis channel and multiple workers to take data from that channel. Now, why that's important is that what channels is designed to do is to allow you to build products at scale. And scale is 
the thing which has caught so many companies by surprise because they start thinking, well, we'll just get a bigger database, we'll just get a faster network connection. And actually, if you really want to do scale, and I, I learned this at the BBC, I mean, when, when suddenly your web, web server that you're, you're trying to support is one of the largest in the world, then it takes more than one machine to support that. And an example on the, the key value store I was working on there, just one tiny bit of the infrastructure that was supporting the website was this CouchDB key value store, and that was, I think, 32 nodes in two data centers, just for one little component in, in it. But that's how you have to do it, you scale out. You have to have multiple servers able to deliver the same services, because then you can add horizontal scaling in. And that's what I'm really excited about with Django channels, because even if you don't want to use it for the WebSocket delivery of real-time data to the users, just that alone, the asynchronous ability to, to farm off long-running tasks to other workers is going to make a massive difference to the efficiency of my site. But having the WebSocket user ability is what's going to be the bright, shiny thing that people are going to go, wow, you can send me streaming data, fantastic. So it comes, when, you, when you install Django channels, you're basically getting five things. And at the moment, um, they're, they're split like this. So you replace the basic web server that you used to have with um, Daphne, which is capable of doing both HTTP and WebSocket. And the good thing about it is they've made it totally backward compatible. So if you already have existing code, you don't have to change it at all. It will keep working. Channels is the, uh, the, the component which actually adds in the integration into Django. And then the other three parts of this are, are part of the, um, it's, it's very disconcerting having somebody taking photos of me. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so the, the, the ASGII um, stuff is what's providing the asynchronous framework that makes, makes you do that, ma ma makes this all possible. And there's two variants you can use. One is using Redis, as I was talking about, to scale out. But if you just want to do a very small scale or development version of it, you can just use a shared memory all on one machine way of doing it. So, it's an official Django project, and it's been funded with some support from Mozilla. I think they've, they've donated about $150,000 to Andrew Goodwin, Godwin to do the initial development. And that's really good news, because it means it's, he, they, they've had time to do it properly. And for those of you who, who don't know, Andrew Godwin is the bloke who wrote the migrations code in, um, in, in Django, which has been a, a terrific boon for us all. So anyway, I've got channels in my website now. And that bit was really easy, so I'm not going to talk about it, because it just worked. But the two really big problems I was left with. Um, one is I've got all this no, nine years' worth of code that was all written to cope with synchronous delivery of data, which now needs to be translated to asynchronous. And because you're having on the client side, within the browser, you're having to interact with these WebSockets and to take this data when, when you, you get it. That means I had to come up with a whole new way of doing the front end. I need to put, have a framework that could cope with collecting the messages and then updating the user, user side. So that meant a whole new tool chain. And so, so when you're doing separating out the, or ch changing the code from being synchronous to asynchronous, you may find that, for example, you, what you used to deliver was a, a bundle of stuff which was a mixture of data and presentation, because that was the, the, the way to do it five, ten years ago. Um, now you have to separate, separate it out so it's only the data. Um, if you're already using some kind of AJAX framework, then that wouldn't be a big deal. But if you're, if you're not, if you haven't done that, if you're look, taking old code, that can take quite a long time because you may be that then you have to end up designing a REST API, for example. And you're certainly going to have to think about the design choices that you're going to make. Because in, in today's internet world, you need to know who your customer is because, for example, a lot of um, companies I've worked with still are under the idea that they're developing for people at home with a fixed landline connection and a desktop. Whereas actually, if you look at the stats for what people are, are, are trending to do now, m more people are on the internet with a mobile device as their only internet device now than that, that is the, now the majority position, mobile only. So if you're trying to program for network 
applications that use the mobile internet as opposed to the landline internet, you have to make some fairly serious choices. Are you aiming to give them the best, well, you're obviously going to aim to give them the best possible experience, but what does that actually mean? Does it mean you're getting them the freshest data? Does it mean that they're, you're using their network connection with the minimum number of bits going over it? If you've got a situation where you've got, you know your customers have got low latency, then are, are, you, are you going to make the choices that say, we'll give you something now or everything later? We, what's, these are the kind of design choices which are new to this, this way of, of working. And then on the client side, so I used to write using, for example, Bootstrap, um, which is a very common framework most people have heard of. Um, I've switched now to Foundation because I think it's better as it happens. But I also needed to add in the, the JavaScript side of it. So I needed to make a choice. Am I going to do Angular, Angular 2, uh, React, uh, whatever the new current shiny framework is? I decided to go with React. And then my problem was, well, how do I make React work with Django? Because it's fine if you're starting from scratch, because the answer is very simple. If you're starting from scratch, what you do is you use Django REST framework to do the data delivery from your Django back end, and you do everything else in the, 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 with, the, with the front end. But if you're, trying to, if you're trying to do a mixture, you've already got working code, trying to put them together, it's, it's like having two completely different cultures, using two different tool chains, and that I found to be the hardest part of the whole experiment of doing this. Um, and with all of these new front-end frameworks, I mean, there's so many of them. You think you, that you've standardized on Gulp, and then suddenly they're talking about Browserify, and, and now Webpack seems to be the flavor of the month. And on the server side, when you're trying to switch from an old-style network deployment to, to this new world where, where you're putting everything in the cloud and you're scaling out, then a lo lot of things that you, the ways you used to do stuff has to change. And again, that took me longer than I, I expected it to, because I already know how to do all of this stuff, except I don't know how to do it within the limitations of what the J Django channels was doing. So a lot of, I had to put a lot of work into the areas I didn't expect to. And the bit which I thought was gonna be hard, which was installing channels, was actually dead, dead simple. And so, I thoroughly recommend you look at Django channels. It's really worth investigating, especially if you're trying to work out how to distribute load at scale. If you're migrating the code, and you've got legacy code, then put aside a lot of time to think about how you're gonna deal with all the issues that, that will come out from it. And I'll tell you, nobody actually expects to be writing legacy code. It's not legacy code when you wrote it. You, you thought it was gonna be something that was going to migrate through, through time. But if you're in a small, small team, and my team is very small, it's me on this project, then, then there's, there's, stuff, there's code there I know that I didn't expect to, to live for more than six months, and still, I'm, I'm still using it eight years later. Document the tool chain. Every hard-earned bit of knowledge you find about how to finally make it work the way you want needs to be written down because I can tell you, you'll forget how to do it the day after. And in my case, what I'm going to do is set up um, a cookie cutter project to map exactly how my com connect combination of React and Foundation um, and Django works together because I've put a lot of effort into um, figuring it all out and I don't want to forget about it. But the next time I do a, a project that uses these things, I'll just be able to go, yep, yeah, new project, and it will just create it for me with all my tool chain in place. So if you're interested in that, check out on GitHub. Um, I'll be tweeting, I'll tweet it out when I've got that up, up there. And the, put the time into the tool chain, because that's what means that you can then get the, the fast, once you've got the setup done, you can start doing the rapid de development that you want to do again. So I'm gonna tell you now, just in summary, what Django Channels actually does very well, and it does asynchronous Django at scale. That's what it's designed to do, and as far as I can see, it's going to do it tremendously well. It means you can, you can add these new features in while still keeping all the Django authentication that you used to have. And if you want some very lightweight distributed, distributed workers, you can use this to, to provide that without having to go to the effort of setting up Celery, which is a standard way that you'd, you'd um, put a queuing in for that. And it is a drop-in replacement for the existing code. 
But what it doesn't do is mm, something which I think anybody embarking on using this should expect to spend some time having to think about. What it doesn't do is to provide persistent web sockets. Now, once you have a web socket connected, it is persistent within its lifetime. So it will stay live until it is closed. And that's how you get the bidirectional um, ability to communicate. But the standard web socket library doesn't provide for, ex for example, reconnection. So should you, for example, you're doing some development, you have to reboot your server because you've just updated the code on the, on the server side. Well, that means that web socket's gone away. And your client side needs to be made to reconnect. Because in the case of doing development, you can just go, OK, I'll just do a, you know, restart that, load the browser, reload the browser. That's not going to be good for your users. And the kind of situations you're going to find will be you're, you, somebody's using it on a, on a phone on the train, and the train goes through a tunnel. So the web socket's gone. And then, so whichever setup you use, finding a way of persisting the web sockets and restarting as needed is, is important. Another thing it doesn't do is to provide offline synchronization, which is one of the things um, which I think would be valuable in any application that's doing this kind of, of, of technology. So what, by that, what I mean is, for example, you're, you're, you're on the phone, you've gone through the, um, you're going through the train tunnel, so you've lost your connection. You want to be able to keep writing the, uh, the notes on Evernote, for example, that you were doing. And then once you get the connection installed, get it uploaded uh, uh, again. And the other thing that ch Channels as a project doesn't do is to provide any client libraries or any real documentation about how to work with these current front, standard front-end projects like React and Angular. Those were the, the three biggest things which I found hurdles in my path of getting this done quickly. And I'm just going to finish up by talking, making a, a comparison with Django channels and Firebase. Now, Firebase is, was a project um, that started as an, a real-time database. They, they were then bought by Google, who have turned it into being a, a complete mobile development platform. And it's, it's very, very good. I recommend you, you take a look at it. There was a very good um, free hacker option uh, on plans. But in some ways, it's better. In some ways, it's not. So I've, I've done this comparison between the two. So the main thing about Firebase is you can't self-host it. You have to use their systems. Whereas with Django channels, you can self-host, which means if effectively it's free. If you can, you don't have to pay an additional usage cost, is what I mean. It's not free because obviously you still have to provide the servers, you have to provide the support. Whereas with Firebase, you, you have a choice. Either you're doing, um, you can pay for a fixed price, limited ability, plan, or you can go on pay as you go. I'll be making these slides available later, um, so if people are interested, then um, watch for the hashtag, and I will, I'll forward out the link. Um, Firebase also solves that problem of persistent connections. Their client libraries that they provide with the, to, for use with things like React and Angular do address that issue, whereas, as I've said, with Django channels, it doesn't. They also do solve the offline synchronization problem. Um, and they have great documentation for the, for the client libraries. Um, but if you want to use it with Django, which, which is, I was doing for, for a while, you end up having to ha manage two separate databases, one being your standard canonical MySQL version and also theirs. Now, theirs is a NoSQL database, whereas Django is very relational. So that's an interesting exercise, keeping those two things synch synchronized. And it may be worth the effort of doing that. It may not. That's a design choice. Uh, in both cases, you can use Django authentication. Um, so in terms of saying, I'm not going to say one is better than the other, because it depends on what you want. Now, for my purposes, I like the concept of free, because Lozmi is a, is a side project. I can't afford for it to cost me money. Um, but with, if I, can, I get access to um, hosts where I can install this on at a, a low cost, then I can effectively run it, for, run it for free, which is terrific. Whereas with, with Firebase, I would have to be going for the pay-as-you-go option, I think, to do what I need to do with it. And the problem with that is 
I don't want to run the risk that the next time TechCrunch get loves me on the front page or CNET and my, my stats go through the roof, that I end up being bankrupted by my side project. This would not be a good outcome. So these are the links. If you're interested in what I'm talking about here, these, these are great links for finding out more about um, Django channels. And I will also be doing um, some follow-up blogging about what I've done and what I've learned and how to solve the problems that I've encountered. So, Jackie M, and uh, have you got any questions for me? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we have some questions for you. Number one, have you noticed uh, any patterns in how internet changed in the last 30 years? Could that be used to predict the future? I think the one thing I've, I've learned that trying to predict the future is, is, is just not very uh, likely to happen. Whatever you think you're planning for is always going to be different. Um, so the only thing you can do is to plan for change. You just don't know what the change is going to be. Do you think the internet change for the better? Well, that's a hard one. Um, I think that in some ways it has, in some ways it hasn't. Obviously having it being much more uh, generally available is a good thing. What people, some people are doing with it is a bad thing. Um, and I think that if I was going to make a prediction about what's going to happen with the internet in the future, I, I would guess that in 10 years' time we will have different internets rather than just having this one. Um, that, that there will be private networks that you can sign up for to pay, you pay more for having them. But I, I don't think that the, I think, I think there's too much distrust of what's happening with your data if it's all out in the open and it's all going through the same channels. Um, and I think that things like the Snowden revelations and the CIA leaks uh, are going to push us more in the direction of wanting to have and pay for private networks. But that's just a guess. Thank you. Uh, is it planned for channels uh, to be part of Django Core in the future? I believe it is, uh, but they were aiming to get it in 1.0. Uh, they were aiming to get it in 1.10. Um, they chose not to because they couldn't get it done in time. So it's an officially supported project. At some point, it probably will be in Core, but I don't know when. Are there any interesting examples of Django channels source code uh, on GitHub that you would recommend that we check out? Uh, well, Andrew Godwin, the guy who wrote it, has got a repository full of examples. So I recommend looking at that. Have you heard about hype-driven development? Don't you think that Ang Angular, React, Docker, etc. are part of it? What do I mean? Hype-driven. Hype. Well, um, yes. I don't think we need another framework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does Django Channels employ also some sort of message queue? Well, it doesn't employ a message queue in the way that you'd understand it um, in terms of, like, like for example, with Celery, where you can do guaranteed delivery and, and that kind of thing. But the use of Redis is, is, is a very basic message queue. And I don't know enough about it to understand what the limitations of that are. But it, it, it is kind of a, mess a simple message queue that you put stuff on there and, and workers pick up the jobs and handle them. Um, but you don't get guaranteed functionality. Oh, and can I just say one, one thing, uh, in answer to the previous question about interesting examples, I'm planning to put some up as, as well, well myself. So again, check out my um, GitHub uh, repo and you'll see some stuff there. And the very last one, how many nodes overall does it take to run the BBC? I have absolutely no idea. I know that the, I personally was involved in managing, um, oh, about 300 and I was one very small part of a one small part of the organization so I have absolutely no idea uh, but it's enormous and it was it was a terrific job I have to say for learning about scale because most of us uh, understand the concept of a deadline as something that can move um, when it's the royal wedding or it's the world cup final that deadline will not move you are going to meet that deadline and you have to learn how to do it at scale and you have to start thinking about problems like what happens when the Queen Mother dies, how are we going to tell the, the, the nation without all the 
ne machines getting overloaded. Um, fascinating job. Lo loved working there. Well, let's give the Queen still some time to live. And um, thank you so much, Rachel, for, for being with us today. Definitely.